Yeah, so usually what I, I'm, I'm just asking is um, general questions at the beginning, but mm -hmm. more like feel comfortable to say anything you want. Yeah. Or it's not, I'm not like sort of researching around a specific issue at this mm -hmm. point, but more about you, about mm -hmm. your work. And I'm very interested to know more about your experience as well. Mm -hmm. Um, in Vancouver, but also internationally, like yeah. how you you work throughout your career, throughout mm -hmm. your work, what interests you, in particular because I thought that you had a very in-depth knowledge of European uh, poetry and yeah. literature mm -hmm. and history, mm -hmm. and also because it seems that you had a lot of influence on some of the other artists from Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And so how is this unfolded and in your mind, but also how do you see it develop? Um, so maybe we can start like that. And sure. Then Should I look at you or the camera? You can look at me. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you, you, you more like sort of that sure. story. And don't, don't hesitate to just continue as long as you think it's... I'm, yeah, I'm used to it. I've done many, many interviews. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and... Also, maybe a second question or maybe a second chapter of that interview would be about uh, the notion of Eurocentric and mm -hmm. history and this idea that you are currently working on, historicity, mm -hmm. and what does it mean for you and how can people work from that notion, which mm -hmm. I think is very important, but I'm very uh, eager to, to learn from that from you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So yeah, anytime we can begin, yeah. So, um, do you want me to just describe my background or something? To, sure, yeah. To start with? Yeah. Oh, well, um, I was born in England, but grew up in Vancouver, basically, and the interior too, for British Columbia in a small town. Uh, both my parents were born in Canada. My mother was born here in Vancouver. Um, so I got roots, deep roots, to this area, to this region. Um, and um, I think from the very beginning of my childhood, I always identified that I was an artist. The idea of being an artist was something that I could identify with. <laughs> and uh, so I taught myself um, art. I didn't have art classes in the little school that I was a part of. and. Um, was always acknowledged by my friends as being an artist. Um, and uh, so that was, you know, doing the, the, the artworks that I have done since childhood would just came naturally to me, something that was just a part of my life. Uh, but I was also interested in poetry and literature and history. Uh, I won, when I finished high school, uh, I was given the first prize in history when I left. So and I was always very, very interested in regional history, history of British Columbia. In fact, the prize that I was given was a book was uh, published in 1958. I graduated from high school in 1960, so it was recently published, uh, The History of British Columbia, and I still have the book. Um, and um, so uh, the idea of history and, uh, you know, who we are and what we do here, etc., was always a part of the way I identified myself and my task. But also, um, I grew up as a fairly poor family in a rather rich community. Uh, so I joke sometimes that the only way that I could attract girls who were come from wealthy families was to write beautiful poetry, right? So I was very early involved in writing poetry and identifying as a poet and published poems in the high school newspaper. I was also the art editor of the high school newspaper. So, you know, and I did cartoons in the paper. Um, and uh, when I was in high school, I I don't know if I'm going into too much detail or not. It's good. Yeah. Um, I was also very excited and interested to discover French avant-garde poetry, like Rimbaud and uh, 
you know, Mallarmé and all the French avant-garde. In fact, I wrote an essay, kind of a well-researched essay in my high school English class, analyzing the poems of T.S. Eliot, who's kind of a highly respected English, well, American origin, but English uh, modernist poet, but whose poetry is very, very much influenced by French avant-garde poetry. So I identified and did research and read all the French avant-garde poetry and showed where T.S. Eliot borrowed specifically from Tristan Corbière and Jules Laforge, etc., etc. So I was very involved with poetry, you know, in my high school years back in the late 50s, early 60s. I was kind of like, you might say, a wannabe beatnik, you know, and I was following the jazz scene and go to the jazz clubs and jazz and poetry was the, an art and modern art was the language that I used that allowed me, I think, to find my identity and uh, my individualism and my confidence to be a loner, like to, and I left home as soon as I finished high school. I left home. So, anyways, to make a long story short, that's my, you know, deep background. And I left um, um, where I lived in West Vancouver. I left uh, home and moved into a, a house that was occupied by art school students. And uh, so I lived, you know, made friends. And, but I was married quite early when I was 20. I was married and had a child uh, at 20 years old. So I had to be serious <laughs> and uh, went to university. I worked also all the time, worked at night, went to university in the day, worked at night. And I was lucky enough and I wrote art criticism, you know, just as a way to make money. And I was interested in the art and I was fairly good as a writer too, you know. So I was able to publish art criticism. I wrote from the newspapers and the Canadian art magazine, et cetera, et cetera, reviews. Uh, so I, and I was also exhibiting art too at a very early age. I d exhibited the first time um, I would be 22 in the Vancouver Art Gallery in 1965. Uh, so, um, and I exhibited pretty regularly since then. So quite early I had some recognition in my early 20s. So, um, and then when I was 24, when I graduated, when I got my degree, at uh, the university in art history. I studied art history. Um, I um, Actually, I took comparative literature first because I thought, you know, my chances of getting a teaching job were better in the literature area. And I took comparative literature and did my first lecture at the university on uh, Rob Grier, the writing of Alain Rob Grier, and uh, cinema, all of his cinematic techniques he used in his writing. So that was my thesis. <laughs> And um, then I studied uh, uh, art history, mostly interested in modern contemporary art. Uh, and then was offered a teaching job, a f formal, I'd never even applied for it, uh, teaching art history at the university in the fine arts department at the university when I was 24 in 1967. So, 20, yes, 24. Uh, so um, I started teaching and I taught right through to 1970 in the uh, art history department, and I had, uh, Jeff Wall was one of my students, uh, Rodney Graham, uh, uh, who became really good friends. Uh, then I just wanted to get out of Vancouver because I lived there all my uh, Vancouver all my life, and I just wanted to become a conceptual artist. I was very involved in conceptual art, conceptual photography in the late '60s. Even though it was earlier, I was exhibiting abstract painting. Uh, I moved away from that and. Um, Moved to London uh, just to leave Vancouver and um, uh, lived in London for a year and got homesick, came back and then got a job teaching at uh, Emily Carr, which is the old Vancouver School of Art uh, in the art history department in 1972 and taught their art history right through to 1998 when I retired. So, and, but all this time I was teaching art history I was writing uh, essays and reviewing exhibitions and publishing um, and doing a lot of research, which I really enjoy, but also exhibiting my work and developing my work and my artistic concepts of modernism, postmodernism, photoconceptualism, you name it, um, through that whole period. So, um, 
And my basic motivation and ideology was at that time in Vancouver, like nobody sold art. It wasn't about money. It was about doing something interesting, you know, and making a culture, what I call a cultural contribution. Of, um, and uh, that's what it was really all about, you know. So what I was actively doing all that period when I was teaching and exhibiting art was, in a sense, doing everything I could it, within my resources and my ability and my perspective on things because I had a very specific personal perspective on what could be done and what was interesting uh, to uh, create an art scene, to create a movement, to create some kind of energy, which I saw had happened in other places. Paris, of course, was you know uh, always a magnet for the development of modernity and modern art, obviously, New York, etc. And of course, I traveled. I first showed in um, Suzanne Paget and Pierre Gaudibert from the uh, Arc, the uh, Musée de l'Art Moderne de la, de la Vie de Paris, came here in 1972. Uh, you know, just looking at what was going on here, and uh, saw my work, and invited me to participate in an exhibition at the museum in um, in Paris in 1973. Uh, so that's my first chance to exhibit uh, in, in the Parisian context in 1973, which for me was really interesting. So I've been going back there ever since. Um, and um, so just developed my work all through the 70s, very, very large scale photographic assemblages, uh, very narrative, kind of developing a concept of narrative in art, in the visual photography, and sequenced images, etc., etc. Uh, works that were really unsellable. They were so large, uh, like 20 and 30 meters in scale, you know. Um, so, but um, uh, it was an important development for me. And um, the, and I had pretty regular exhibitions of that work all through the 70s and into the 80s. Into the 80s, I turned back to folding my photography back into painting concepts with the ground as being canvas and abstract painting on canvas with the photograph attached to it since the early 80s. And that was, has been sort of the main model of my work ever since. Um, then quite a few video works, et cetera, some performance work, um, a lot of text-based pieces as well. Um, and um, uh, continued all my writing and research, of course, through all that period. Um, and um, didn't have a gallery. The first gallery that, uh, the oldest gallery that I've ever worked with to represent my work and still work with them is a gallery, it was Mir Ryu back in 1989. Uh, no, it was, sorry, it was Jonen. Jonen Schuttler in Cologne, Germany was the first. And Rudiger Schuttler in Munich were the first European galleries to feature my work. 1986, um, and then 1989, I started with uh, uh, Mirtreu, which is now Gallery Greta Mirt in Brussels, and also later in 1989 was Gabriel Maubry in Paris, and 1990 was Thomas March or Gallery Temple in Valencia, Spain, um, and uh, then Nicole Klagsburn in New York, and then after Nicole Klagsburn, it was American Fine Arts, and then. Yvonne Lambert, and uh, Yvonne Lambert also in Paris, and then Hausenworth. So it's been, you know, 50 years now of exhibiting and producing work uh, and, um, ex you know, exhibiting internationally and nationally. Uh, and I, of course, I have also in Vancouver, Catriona Jeffries Gallery that I've been working with, and um, Jessica Silverman in San Francisco. And, um, uh, and now Paro and Romero in Madrid, I'm working with now. And uh, so it keeps me busy. <laughs> and uh, um, so, but I'm still, even though I've retired from teaching, art history specifically was 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, it was 1998. Um, uh, I still do, consistently do research. Uh, in art history, 
uh, of all kinds uh, of areas of art history I'm interested in. I'm interested in cave painting, and I've you know visited some of the main sites in France, um, and uh, you know think about the significance of that work of cave painting as art. Uh, when I was um, teaching at uh, the Emily Carr College of Art, which was superseded the Vancouver School of Art, I uh, wrote a very, very large uh, course of art history. The la it was a uh, 20 one-hour lectures of, in the history of art. You know, it's just a kind of survey course for beginners, basically. Um, which, um, for me, covered, from my perspective, which is fairly, I would say my perspective is fairly conservative, fairly generic. I wasn't making any great changes to the narrative of what we call Western art history, basically. But um, I did um, attempt to fold in an understanding of prehistoric art and all other non-Western forms of art as a concept of what art is as a, as a symbolizing activity uh, created by various cultures and for various ends in various ways. Um, and, um, but it's, uh, of course, my focus is obviously within the framework of Western art history and its self-conscious historicizing of its own art history. And that's what makes it kind of distinctive, this concept of, of, of history, which is I've always found to be important to understand for myself too, because I, in a sense, construct my own art history, my personal art history. And I, I do a lot of writing about my own work, probably more than most artists. I write, constantly write commentaries on work, work that goes to museums and collections. Um, not always, but mo usually I write a detailed commentary explaining my intentions in the work, how I uh, I think the work could be understood. It's not never the limit of how to understand it, but it's uh, an avenue for understanding the work, especially for curators in the museums. When they go to write their little placards next to the work in the exhibition, it, uh, it's always a help. And um, I'm, I like to be understood because I have very specific intentions when I do my work. Uh, I like it to be understood what those intentions are. and I even though some people say I say too much about it and I should let people make up their own mind. I, I do let people make up their own mind, you know. It's not to create a value judgment about the work, but it's to create a clear understanding of what I think my intentions are. Uh, and sometimes the work doesn't match my intentions. You know, it's like happens with any artist. Not every work you do, in a sense, uh, resolves the way you think it should resolve, you know. Uh, but every work is an attempt to make meaning, to make a representation that means something and has a relationship to understanding. It's a communicative device. Also, uh, every work of art for me is also a sensory object. Uh, I enjoy to look at my own work. <laughs> you know, I, I create compositions and use color and use imagery that I like to look at and I like to enjoy the satisfaction of seeing what I see is a perfectly balanced composition. Um, uh, I don't expect everybody to see things my way, but uh, that's what I, wa I want to talk about. And that's what I do. Uh, and I'm lucky because I think lots of people, not everybody, obviously, I've got many people that find my work probably boring or uninteresting or irrelevant or whatever. Um, and that's, you accept that. Um, but I'm lucky that I've, had, I think, a successful career that gives me satisfaction that what I've had to say in the, in the area of visual art has been understood and appreciated by other people, which is what we do to create culture, isn't it? To share our perceptions of the world with other people in the hope, obviously, for me, that it triggers off the ability of other people to generate their own perception that then allows them to continue the dialogue in their works of art, or their conversations, or their understandings of things, uh, their aesthetic, you might say, you know. And uh, on that level, uh, I'm obviously very interested in philosophy, you know. Like, that's why I've always been interested in, in conceptual art. I've been always interested in the kinds of ideas, the kinds of thoughts, and the kinds of understandings that a work of art 
can hand on from one generation to another. And my teaching, it was a job, obviously. I had to pay the rent and support a family. So teaching was obviously a survival mechanism. Uh, but it was also for me uh, a stage to a platform to spread my ideas and uh, communicate with other people on another level and also open up potentials of other people's creativity to do to make their contribution you know so I've always supported my students and uh, encouraged them and and many of my students have gone on to amazing careers um, and which is another kind of satisfaction you know um, uh, and I always say I have to say repeat uh, that the students I had I always acknowledge that I've learned more from them than I'm sure they've ever learned from me you know and the great satisfaction one can have in in the education and the teaching profession is to create the atmosphere and the potentials for people to open up their creativity which you can receive and it energizes the teacher you know um, and I always had good teachers when I was a student as a youngster so and I always had very good rapport with my teachers and it was a dialogue always you know it wasn't a one-way street of information it was a dialogue and uh, that's the way I was like it to be you know and how would you explain that success that both way relationship in education but also mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, I mean, I'm really interested in the idea of modernity, you know, about what it is to live the present. What is it that we need to know and what, what are the things that we need to do in the present to make life meaningful, you know, to, uh, and, and of course we live under very specific pressures and experiences in modern life today with, uh, you know, modern technology uh, being drowned in, in an atmosphere that's dominated by modern technology, urban living, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, how do we survive as individuals and how do we find our humanity in these kind of dominant structures that we live in today? And I think that's through creativity and through self-expression. Um, and I've always believed that, and that's to live in a modern way. To live in the modern life, you have to find your individuality and not be afraid to speak and contribute you know, to other people. Um, and I think other people recognize these, the, you know, some of the modernity that I try to communicate in my work. Uh, it's, it opens up vocabularies for other people to use, I hope. Not, I don't mean for people to copy my work. That's not what I'm saying. You know, the work is only a trigger to, for people to open up their, what they view as a set of potentialities. It's, it's a very liberal, <laughs> a very liberal kind of outlook, I think. But that's also a survival mechanism. I, I think uh, to survive um, intellectually, uh, in terms of one's personal life, to you know, safeguard your individuality, to not be overcome by, by pressures that turn you into somebody you're not, you know, you always have to be yourself, um, is, means that you have to find the language to speak that through. And for me, visual art is, is the, the language to use. For me, it's the, the one that is... Um, and I, I, I'm really interested in film and video and all the dramatic arts, that what you might call the time-based medium. But um, I prefer what I call the static visual arts, or wall art in many ways, because it allows people to kind of touch or land on various kind of lily pads in this great pond of life in the museum, for instance, um, and yet walk away when you want to. You're not bound by the time frame of the, of the, of the expressive object. I uh, like painting allows you to control your body movement and your ambient space. Uh, the distance you have to it, you can come up to it and go leave it and, you know, all such. Most of what, you know, forms of contemporary today follow that. Uh, but at the same time, I myself used video in the time based arts. Uh, and to the point sometimes where it's extremely boring. <laughs> I've, I've did a video uh, once of, well, more than once, of just myself reading. 
you know, like what's, you know, it's like so nothing is happening except for it's just me reading. And what a book I was reading was Kierkegaard's The Concept of Irony, right? Because <laughs> people at the art school were always like, oh, Ian Wallace, he's an academic. He's not a real artist. He's just a conceptual artist. And all they do is read and, and think, right? They don't make real art. So, because I was in an art school that dominated by a painting faculty, of which I'm also very interested in. So I did a performance piece in a gallery that was just me reading, which is what people expected me to do, right? <laughs> to, to be a reader, you know. Anyways, that's, uh, <laughs> and I do a lot of reading. It's my, my, my intellectual feedback. Because literature and writing is phenomenal. You can draw upon the thoughts of, I mean, from thousands of years of literature. I stick mostly to contemporary literature and philosophy and poetry. Um, but to draw from this, the idea, the concepts and the ideas and the thoughts, it gives me a lot to feed from, you know, it's, and, and I prefer doing that. I, I do watch television like everybody, but I don't, I'm not a person that looks for entertainment. To me, life is, I create my own entertainment when I have my jam sessions of music with my friends. Uh, so I'm not interested in being entertained so much as developing my ability to understand and what I need to do as an artist, for one thing. and the things that I can think about and talk about to constantly enlarge my intellectual perspectives on things. So I like to read. <laughs> and what about um, Hegel and Marcuse that you mm -hmm. mentioned before and you haven't yeah. talked about? Yeah. Um, I uh, have I've been reading, you know, the philosophic literature of the Frankfurt School for a long time, you know. Uh, Marcuse, of course, was you know, a member of the Frankfurt School, basic law, well, kind of auxiliary member, maybe some people would say. Um, and because uh, he was very important in the 60s, especially in the student movement in Southern California in the 60s. Um, and uh, so, you know, Marcuse had some early important things and important experiences too you know, within the German, modernist German philosophic tradition coming from the development of philosophy in the German universities in the 19th century. Hegel is a classic, uh, right through to, say, writers like Heidegger, Martin Heidegger in the 20th century, uh, Husserl, Edmund Husserl, etc. Um, dealing with phenomenology and uh, existentialism and like, what is it to be and what becoming is and historicity, etc. How, how, how do we account for all these thoughts? But a lot of that literature is very, very difficult and I I have to admit, uh, much of it I do not fully grasp intellectually. But in trying to understand it, I develop my own interpretations of what I think that it might lead to those thoughts. And um, uh, the book I was discussing uh, that you're, I think you're referring to is the Hegel's uh, uh, Theory of Historicity by Her uh, Herbert Marcuse, um, which was his doctoral thesis written for Husserl um, and um, uh, just before, in the 1930s, uh, Freiburg University, just before Marcuse migrated to the United States during the period of anti-Semitism and uh, Nazism, just so he managed to get out just in time. Um, but um, um, all of that material is very, very interesting. In fact, another key figure is, of course, Theodore Adorno, who wrote Aesthetic Theory, published in English in 1970, I think. No, he wrote it in 1970. I have the English first English translation uh, done in 1984, which I bought then and I still have and still read. Again, very, very difficult writing, difficult thoughts, but uh, I think very useful as a kind of reflective literature to reflect upon, to follow what he's saying. and to. I taught a seminar at the University of British Columbia in the 90s uh, using uh, only 20 pages of the Adorno book. And I, I, I told the students, oh, in this whole term, it was like a three month term, I said, if we can get through 20 pages, we'll consider ourselves lucky. You know, so we only focused on 20 pages of the, the book by, um, by Adorno. And it provided incredible discussion points for the students through the whole seminar. So it wasn't a necessarily about coming to a complete understanding of, of, of Adorno's aesthetic theory, 
but it was just about using that as a trigger points for people to come to their own interpretations, just like any work of art. Um, and it, uh, one of my main tasks was to make art students and young artists not afraid to read difficult philosophy and difficult literature and poetry and to be able to, you know, overcome the hesitation of intellectual, of approaching intellectual literature in a creative way. And I think Adorno's aesthetic theory, for instance, was dictated by him in the morning before he started his own classes. It was basically him just rambling off his thoughts in the morning to a, uh, somebody who took down his right, and that was the, what was published. <laughs> so it was, for even for uh, Adorno, it was kind of a, a performance piece, as I see it anyways. And that's what makes it difficult, too, because his thoughts were not necessarily clearly organized. Uh, when, I do, when I do any writing, I try to write as clearly and precisely as possible so that anybody could follow what I think I'm saying. You know, that's <laughs> clarity is, is, I suppose it's my English <laughs> interest in English clarity and no nonsense writing, you know, because there's a lot of nonsense in the, in the writing of art history. Um, I've written my share of nonsense too, by the way. <laughs> my, the, during the postmodern period in the 70s, it was kind of fashionable to write in a difficult way, in a short, shorthand way. At school at five years old, you mentioned about that all your professors were Japanese. Oh, yes. Some yeah. of them were Japanese, mm -hmm. and that you practiced some sort, sort of a atomic bomb practice <laughs> exercise. So yeah. How is this? Because early memory, five years yeah. old, very early, so yeah. it's very vivid. Yeah. I thought, could you unfold yeah. that? Well, I lived in this small town in the interior of British Columbia, right on the American border, that was a basically a gold mining area and ranching and gold mining. Uh, cattle and wild, went freely roamed through the town. Kids, cattle, coyotes and rattlesnakes, I always say, roamed freely through this little town. It was very open. Um, and during the Second World War, uh, after Pearl Harbor, uh, Japanese who had emigrated and become settled in the Vancouver area, especially in the fishing, uh, uh, they were uh, uh, arrested, rounded up, and put in internment camps in the interior, um, including you know these ghost towns where they could be away from the coast because they, on the coast, they were afraid of a Japanese invasion during the Second World War in the Pacific Front. Uh, it never happened, but I don't know. I get they were being overly cautious, I suppose. But um, the Japanese were moved into the. There were a number of large, older buildings excuse me, there were abandoned hotels. So they were housed in these older abandoned buildings. I don't know how, I don't know the population. It might have been maybe a hundred. Not large, but large enough. Um, the children of the families that were there became my friends. Um, and we moved there in 1948. My father was a soldier in the war and demobilized and he got a job in this little town in the general store. Um, and so we moved and he built a little house there we lived. Um, so uh, 1948 was only three years after the end of the war. So the Japanese were still there. They had actually settled there and started working in the lumber mill and had a, an economy and were raising families and their children were my age too, you know. So, and... Um, uh, they, my teachers were Japanese women. Miss Takimoto, I remember, was my one of my favorite teachers. Um, the in the town at New Year's, the big uh, wasn't so much Christmas there as New Year's was the big uh, holiday, uh, and the, all the Japanese families would open up their houses to all everybody from the town would go from house to house and eat sushi and the Japanese food and listen to music and, and a member in the community hall, uh, the Japanese did their dance performances and costume and everything. So there was a strong Japanese or Asian community there. Also the other community there was interesting was the Dukabors, Sons of Freedom Dukabors, that were um, uh, uh, inspired by the anarchist philosophies 
of Tolstoy, and they they were uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, they were running into confrontations with the Russian government at the time, who wanted them to join the army, and they didn't want to. They were against being in the army, against paying taxes, and against their children going to school. So they were kind of anarchist group community. So they moved to Canada, about 1905, I believe, in the first Russian Revolution, um, and then a break-off group called the Sons of Freedom, that were even more anarchist group than the than the Orthodox Dukobors. Uh, they moved to British Columbia and moved into the Kootenays and the area around Midway. And so the local people in there were the farm. They were the farmers. They provided the milk, the vegetables and, and uh, uh, poultry and beef, etc., etc., for the town because it was kind of isolated town. Uh, so they were uh, the Sons of Freedom Dukabor. So my, the other friends that I had there were uh, children of anarchist Dukabor sect from Russia. So that was kind of a, and we were almost the only Anglo people in the town, you know. All the Anglos had moved to the coast. But, uh, oh, back to uh, this the story I mentioned earlier. I remember like one of the fun things we would do is the teachers would have us do air raid, air raid exercises. Because at that time, you know, there was the Cold War and the confrontation between the United States and Russia going on, and they were afraid of an atomic bomb. Atomic warfare was very serious uh, stuff at the time, and still is, of course. Um, but the, even though Midway was not a place where they would bother to drop a bomb, the Japanese teachers would have us practice hiding underneath our desks. So we would get to, as kids, we would get to duck underneath our desk, which, of course, is a fun game to play when school gets boring, you know. <laughs> so, um, but w later on I reflected on this and I realized that, you know, they were, the teachers were probably themselves still angry about being taken away from the coast and moved to the interior, to this little town. And it was their way of, of dealing with that, you know, creating these absurd situations around warfare that, was not possible in this little town. It, was, it didn't make sense. Um, and I always remember the Japanese families always talking about, the older men especially, talking about going back to the coast. And as a, as a child, I had no idea what that meant. What do you mean going back to the coast? I didn't even, I thought they were always there. You know? And uh, it was only much later when I understood the history of why they were there that I realized what going back to the coast meant to them. But that's uh, one of the exciting things about living in a place like British Columbia. You have all of these strange, quite fragmented and isolated, but very interesting, but also cosmopolitan communities. And all of these things wrap up to give one a, a small child like myself a kind of an interesting education, I think. You know, you're not surrounded by just like one single group that's your tribe. You have to deal with other tribes as well, you know. And uh, another thing about this school I was in is that uh, we, there was no doctor. The closest doctor was a hundred miles away, you know. So there was no a doctor came once a year to check the children at the school, and we would have to line up and do the eye examination test. Of course, it was a game I always lost because I was born nearsighted, and I couldn't see what. And all my friends, they could read the chart, but I couldn't. So I would conveniently disappear when the game, that game was played. <laughs> um, so I never even realized what the world really looked like. So, but what I could do was, I was good at drawing because I could see things up close. So I learned to draw quite early, copying from illustrations, comic books and everything. And I got good at teaching my friends how to draw. So that was the way. I couldn't play baseball because I couldn't see the ball coming at me, but I could teach my friends to draw. So you, you get the your friends to pay attention, admire you. Every every child has to have something that they feel that they're good at that other people can acknowledge. It's a way that children get confidence, you know. And when people have something that they're when children have something good at, it's important, especially for adults, to encourage that, right? So. Um, my specialty was being the, the class artist, even very young, like six, seven, eight, nine years old. When I moved to the coast, I was 10 years old. Um, 
And uh, I remember doing a big drawing at the whole back of the room, a great big life-size drawing of an African village. Um, for me, it was like Africa was an exotic land I could only read about in the National Geographic magazine, etc. You know, so I got ideas about Africa. Did a big drawing of an African village that was, I think, quite good. I wish I had a picture of it. But uh, when I left the school to move to Vancouver, North Vancouver, uh, and I remember bragging to my friends that I'm going to move into a house that has two stories, you know, because everybody just lived, except for the Japanese in the hotels, we only lived in small houses that only had no upstairs, right? It was just one level. Anyways, um, they gave me an oil painting set as my going away present. And I still have some of the original little oil paintings I did with that oil painting set uh, that I was given. So I got very early, at 9 and 10 years old, acknowledgement as being the class artist. But when I came to North Vancouver, and as soon as I went into to school and sitting, the teacher writes on the blackboard. And of course, in the small school in the interior, when the teacher wrote on the blackboard, I could get out of my desk and go up to the blackboard to read it. So it wasn't a problem. But when I in North Vancouver, when I get out of my seat to go up to, while the teacher writes on the blackboard, the lessons, they were saying, well, what are you doing up here? You're supposed to be in your desk. And I said, well, I just came up to read on the blackboard what you're writing. They said, you can't see the blackboard from your desk? And I said, well, no, I just come up to see it <laughs> now. And so they sent me to have my eyes tested. <laughs> and it turned out I needed glasses, which for me was a revelation because I went to the optometrist and got my first pair of eyeglasses. I was 10 years old. Ah, a whole new world. <laughs> I could see the movie. I always remember I got out, left the optometrist office with my new glasses, and across the street was the movie theater, and I could read what was the movie that was playing on the movie theater. If I could, ah, yes. <laughs> I can see what seeing and having good eyesight is all about, you know. So I wear contact lenses now, but I wore glasses for years and years and years. Anyway, sorry, that's a long, that's good. That's a good. long story for a simple question. <laughs> but but seeing uh, clearly the world is a part of what being an artist is too, you know. But maybe also seeing the world not clear also contributes to being an artist. Sorry, continue. That's good, yes, thank you. <laughs> Maybe we can come back to this concept of historicity. Mm -hmm. If you could summarize what it is for you and what you're trying to do around Eurocentric notions, mm -hmm. how to get out of Eurocentric yeah. forms. Oh. Well, that's a, that's a long discussion. <laughs> um, and uh, for a long time I've been uh, interested, I think, uh, regionally in terms of Vancouver and British Columbia are like this region of which I think there's a very, well, it's it's the culture that I live in mostly and contribute to and have my friends and the things that I think are important to do here, um, uh, even though obviously I think in a much broader geography than just the local region, but uh, in a broader time than now too, because I'm interested in everything from the very beginning of history to now. Um, but um, I just felt that it was really necessary for quite some time to uh, pay attention to the history of this particular region, you know, you might say, which is a, a, f a former colony. It's going through various historical transformations uh, from its pre-colonial period of just being First Nations territories with all of its history, if we can describe it as such, of uh, Aboriginal and Indigenous art. Um, art forms and history too. There's art, art and history go together. In other words, social and economic and, and territorial history go together. Uh, but obviously, I'm my cultural background is a part of a colonizing relationship to this territory, which is a fairly recent history. Only maximum 200 years, maybe a little bit more than that, if you really want to stretch it out. But really, uh, it's very recent by normal kind of historical narratives. Um, so I've been really interested in developing, a, you know, how to do the research and developing a concept of what would be a relevant form of historical investigation to describe the, the culture of this region and its background, how it, who, 
who are the people that have created the, the you know, what are its manifestations, um, and how to describe it in a way that is really correct, you know. And uh, when one kind of looks at history, which is fundamentally what I call ideological, in other words, it constructs a narrative or a myth that rationalizes identity, or rationalizes uh, politics, or rationalizes uh, a sense of presence and legitimacy of one element, one social element in relationship to any other social element. And the unique feature here being a colonizing culture, the relationship between the dominant European cultures that have occupied this territory and the original First Nations or indigenous or Aboriginal uh, cultural manifestations that preceded it. And what are the relations between those two? Um, and uh, in investigating how to describe this relationship, I you know, have to acknowledge that the very concept of history that I am attempting to describe is fundamentally Eurocentric. In other words, uh, the concept of history as a discipline of attempting to ascertain the historical facts, the uh, agencies and the narratives that are, have been developed over time, the people involved, and to uh, record and document that and then analyze what that means as a totality, as a narrative, in relationship to the, you know, is a particular kind of Eurocentric concept of what history and chronologies are. And trying to understand that relationship to a pre-colonial or pre-European contact indigenous concept of history, which is also can be seen as history, uh, but is built as a set of what you call mythic narratives, you know, that involves symbolic storytelling that's passed down over generations, family to uh, family, etc., all through another kind of historical epoch that doesn't exactly match the philosophic fundaments or the scientific fundament, let's call it, of Eurocentric concept of what history is or historicity. Um, <clears throat> Hegel and Marcuse and uh, Heidegger in particular also had another concept of historicity, which is about a personal time. It's about becoming like uh, interior time of individual, of the concept of the individual mentality, or you might call the existential presence of individual consciousness, of personal consciousness in relationship to a larger dominant concept of the flow of history and time that is chronological in the in the temporal sense, or in the temporal, chronological mean the same thing, so that's kind of repetitive. Sorry, this sometimes gets a bit vague and a bit difficult to reduce to a simple description. Um, but what I'm trying to do right now is rationalize and, and legitimize, or understand at least, what the relationships between these two concepts of history might be, uh, so that I don't want to overwhelm or overcome a mythic concept of history, which is also has its legitimacy by a scientific concept of history that is produced by the dominant culture that's actually trying to describe this situation, which is what I'm trying to do. Like I have to acknowledge, I'm coming from a Eurocentric philosophic point of view. I can't deny that. To deny it would be to create a false, ident a false relationship already, which isn't what science and history is all about. I'm not, that's not the point. Um, there are some reactionary ideologies that are quite happy to create false histories to legitimize a uh, corrupt form of, of, of politics, you know, as we know. Uh, you know, there's all, that happens all the time, as a matter of fact, uh, by all kinds of cultures and not just Western Eurocentric culture. Uh, we've seen that happen. Uh, what I'm interested in is and I think this might be a part of the, the reconciliation process that's going on between what it means to be a colonizing culture, what we call a settler culture, and, and the pre-European contact Aboriginal culture uh, and, and the relations between those two. Mind you, this colonizing culture is changing and also the Aboriginal culture is also changing because that's what history is. It's the flux and change through process and time. You know, the 
how people's identities and how people's rationalizations and their objectives in life and their value systems all mutate in time. That, and we all have to do that to adjust to the changes of social, economic, and technological life that we undergo. Uh, and I mean, there's a lot of resentment amongst uh, Aboriginal people about the way they've been treated and what they've been, how their territory has been occupied and what they've been left with uh, by the occupying, occupying colonial culture. But I think, personally, in all things added up, Aboriginal culture has benefited incredibly from European contact. So, and that's obviously from a contact of a Eurocentric point of view. I think not every Aboriginal person would have, would agree with that or, or appreciate that. But I think, you know, all things added up. I think that really, I think that most Aboriginal people don't want to turn the back the clock. I think they can, there can be a reconciliation and there can be a, a meeting point. And, cult, and, and art history is one of those meeting points like between, you know, what is true creativity and what are the languages we speak our culture through. And to be honest and sincere and authentic about these languages, um, and yet accepting change and mutation through time as well. In other words, live modernly, live in a modern life. And that's how, you know, basically we will integrate and create reconciliation of sorts, you know. For, you know, like even the, the so-called European historical uh, story is was created that way. You know, there were indigenous tribes in Europe that were invaded by other tribes, overcome, overwhelmed, you know, from the Roman Empire through the Holy Roman Empire, through all of the battles that happened uh, through time in the history of Europe, uh, all kinds of relations between indigenous and colonizing and occupying or imperial powers all in a flux that's created uh, I forget the writer, he wrote a book called The European Tribes, <laughs> kind of looking at Europeans and, all, and you know, all the different uh, languages and all the different peoples that have populated Europe. It's because it was a wild group of tribes that were kind of never pure in their racial or, or, or cultural background, and it's always a mix, which I think has made Europe one of the more, you know, such a dynamic culture and influential over the whole world because it has always been never pure. It's always been a mixed culture of many, many different cultural influences over time. Uh, and I think we can learn from that and benefit from it, I think, I hope, <laughs> um, even though sometimes, uh, I mean, along with, you might call the the uh, scientific basis of a an, historical interpretations of what our culture is mutating through time. There's also what we call ideological mut uh, situations going on. Now, I define ide ideology as the rationalization of belief. Like the things that we believe are to be true, uh, we create reasons for those things to be true. And that's what I call rationalization. Sometimes those reasons are genuine and authentic and accurate and other times they're not. And what we have to do is be really aware, and this is what I'm doing right now, is to be self-critical and self-conscious about our rationalizations to be able to accurately measure what point when we use a reason to legitimate a thought or a value structure that those reasons are authentic and not just a, a excuse for being able to do something, you know. Or, or accept an idea or legitimize an idea. And that, it's so easy to, to do and it's done all the time because people want to feel confident that what they're doing is right, even when it's not right. Um, and I think, for instance, the, the, um, the priests and the religious people that came here at the very beginning and wanted to convert the Aboriginal people, the First Nations people to Christianity, I think they thought they were doing the right thing because they believed in what they were doing as, as religious and they thought that, you know, they would be helping the First Nations people by converting them to Christianity. So um, there's an example, like they probably in the end, I would say likely, not doing a benefit for the First Nations people <coughs> because they've had to live, live down that history of the residential schools and all of the 
uh, kind of uh, attempt to annihilate the mythology and the and the spiritual beliefs of Aboriginal peoples at the very beginning, in other words, their fundamental historical culture that goes back deep into time to modernize it and bring it under the, under the authority of a settler colonial religious belief, you know. So that was wrong, I think. Uh, and uh, I'm not a religious person in that sense, so I, can, I don't have any difficulty in criticizing that. Um, but I think in the intentions of those priests were they had, because they believed in what they were doing. They thought that they were doing the right thing. So I don't blame them for what they were doing. Uh, but, uh, but in those religious cultures, they don't use what we call self-critical thinking. <laughs> it's only, you know, r ritual and, you know, received ideas that is being inherited and used. Uh, likewise, for a lot of the mythologies and the rationalizations of identity, etc., by First Nations too, or also, you know, ideological in the sense that they, they're, what they believe in is rationalized by the myths and the stories that they've been brought up with uh, and the family traditions, all of which is legitimate in many, many ways. Uh, but um, uh, a modern culture, which is a mix of so many different peoples and elements and cultures and beliefs has to be self-conscious. We have to, you know, measure out our beliefs in ways that recognizes and respects the beliefs of other people and their individuality is the same without being overwhelming to say, I have the truth and my truth is the only truth. You know, and, and you know, and I think in looking at a history of trying to describe a history of the West of this region of British Columbia, for instance, which was very late in colonizing, as I said, we have to be aware that you know the truths that we're putting forward and the reasons that we're doing it have to be authentic and also measured out correctly between all of the different rationalizing and ideological motivations that we might or might not have. As a matter of fact, I would say that my motivation is also ideological. Like, I believe in the importance of memory in history to, in order to even know who we are right now and what we're doing here and why we're here and how we got here and what it means to be here and, and you know, all those things. And we have to, and also to respect and acknowledge, for instance, for me, the artists who have made vital contributions to describing the culture that we do have inherited today. So many young people, they just assume that everything is the way it always was, you know, that everything has always been the way it is now, which isn't true. Like the, what they're, the options that young people have today are options that were fought for by people that went beforehand, including even freedom and democracy that people just assumed that it was always there. And it's, I mean, the freedoms and democracies and the rights that we have as citizens today are fairly recent. You know, like I would never want to go back in time. No such thing as the good old days is one of the things I always say. There's no such thing. My grandfather, for instance, came to Canada. He was the youngest of a farming family in England, this is on my mother's side, for instance, and also on my father's side. And uh, the youngest son didn't get any land because all the older brothers got the land first. So my grandfather on my mother's side, he had to come to Canada. He had to work as a child laborer on a farm in eastern Canada for 10 years to pay for his boat trip. This is the early 20th century, 1910. Uh, and so he did that. Today, that would be not allowed. That's called slave, child slave labor, right? Which in many countries is still practiced. But it was also practiced here as early as the early 20th century. Um, and my grandfather was one of those people. I would, you know, like you come from working class background in Canada, in, in England and Europe, you had to leave. You were an outcast in this fact. So a lot of the early settlers that came here were outcasts and survivors. They just wanted to, children that wanted to survive for the most part. And they went through incredibly difficult times uh, to settle in a place like Canada. You know, when you're a, a, a small family moving to the prairies in, the, in 1900 or 1880, a, you had to find a place to live and you had to build your 
home and house and feed yourself and your family out of nothing. It was just like, you know, it was just the raw earth. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't like we do today. We fly from one place to another and we're fed good food and have good places to stay. <laughs> we're just so lucky now compared to what our people ahead went through, you know. And that's not usually described very clearly. It's, you know, uh, usually in the description of the colonializing, colonizing of this area, it's kind of like imperial armies marching in and taking over and everything just being laid out for people. It wasn't that way at all. The only way you could get here before 1887 was all the way from England, all the way around the bottom of South Africa, South America, Cape Horn, and then back up the coast. It was about two months on a boat to get here. It wasn't a nine hour flight. It was two months. And so you were really cut off when you came here to find a place to live. You know, it was a, There was no train or anything across North America at the time. That didn't happen until the first railway was 1887. 1886 arrived in Vancouver, which was just a little over 100 years ago. It's not very long. Sorry, I'm going on. <laughs> but these are all like backgrounds to what happens here, you know. Yeah. And related to your more recent works, um, the one behind you, but also the one, mm -hmm. the ones that were there where you were also working on New York oh, yeah. streets. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that was Christos de Kierkegaard that mm -hmm. said that you don't think that we live in a colonial times. Mm -hmm. And then you responded like, we are colonized by monopoly capitalism. Yeah. Sort of. So is this related to your work somehow? Yeah, the, all, all my um, pictures of urban scenes, uh, the streets and the buildings and the or, you know, modern uh, corporate architecture uh, in the divisions of space, like a lot of my work in composition is about divisions of space um, and about the eye measuring movements in space. Um, uh, that's basically what composition is, relative balance of things. Um, is um, all of the space that we have in the modern city is all, and the concept of property, is all developed as a part of the particularization, or in other words, the, the fragmentation of the unity of the world into discrete elements of space that's bought and sold and marketed. In other words, our whole physical environment is already totally mapped and divided up and um, marketed as products of international monopoly capitalism, you know, uh, right from um, the buying a, a toothpaste right to the selling of property on the moon, which is what they're working towards right now, right, in outer space. In fact, and this is, you know, part of the ongoing colonization that process that has happened through the whole history of modernity um, from the well, beginning basically in the 15th century, if you, or you can go back earlier, but it really took off in the 15th century, the whole uh, concept of uh, claiming space in the divisions. It, I, um, I've been working on a research thesis that's about the relation of the invention of linear perspective to divisions of space. The, the development of the representation of linear perspective was one of the first um, moments in the development of modern capitalism that's about the measuring and particularization out of space uh, in a logical scientific way and and also a way that can be fragmented and marketed um, uh, that I did a, a big exhibition in 2010 uh, called uh, the financial district which was about um, a corporate architecture financial architecture in eastern Canada and Toronto uh, that was all about this thesis about the marketing of, of, of space uh, coming from the development of linear perspective. But even the modern camera, in fact, linear perspective was created as a photographic process before photography uh, by Brunelleschi and Alberti, uh, who were architects as well as painters. Um, when they invented, you know, scientific measurements 
of linear space in, in the vanishing point of modern perspective. Um, and uh, they, and that box or that camera that they had with a photographic plate on it became the modern camera. So the whole development of the use of photography historically has, is a, and just another example of the, you might say the, the modularize creation, creation of space as a modular particularization of the unity of space into fragments that are created as representations. Um, and um, it's tied very closely to architecture. Uh, in fact, the camera and the camera obscura, camera means room in Italian, right? Uh, and so the camera is the room in which the image takes place. Uh, and in this room is a window. So I see the room and the window uh, is the, you know, the rectangularity of the canvas and the rectangularity of a photograph is just a mimicking of what we call the picture window, even uh, today in modern architecture. And uh, that's, and we use that as in forms of representation. That's a very modern form of representation. For instance, we were talking about Aboriginal art, you know, pre-European contact Aboriginal art. They didn't use cameras or windows, right? I mean, the window was not their metaphor for the particularization of space, because their hand, their understanding of territory was totally different. Uh, or else when, when Europeans took colonized North America, I mean, you fly over Canada and you fly over the prairies, and you see the prairies are all divided into rectangles as far as the eye can see. This is very, very, this is what I mean by the, the particularization of space. Uh, and the modern city is divided into rectangles for an efficient distribution of property and on its ownership. It's just like products on the shelf of a store. <laughs> all the streets and everything. That's why I do the pictures of New York, which is the, what do you call it, the most symbolic city of modern high capitalism is New York City, of course, you know. Yeah, which was founded by the Rockefeller. Rockefeller's yeah, like basically, yeah. Bought yeah. from... From Holland, the Dutch. Indian, uh, right? Yeah, the Dutch were the first to uh, colonize the New York as an island, the island of Manhattan. It was a Dutch colony. Uh, but in a war between England and Holland, England took over the Dutch colony and became an English colony until the American Revolution, yeah. And actually Washington DC is the capital of the new United States in the late 18th century was um, a, a French military engineer designed the layout of Washington DC uh, as like the way a classic military layout in the rectangle of streets, uh, which was uh, at that time influenced also by Roman military uh, uh, military layouts for mobile uh, campaigns for the Roman camps were all laid out in a very logical grid-like format. And when I, uh, just to get back to your first question, my pictures of the streets is just in an, in an investigation of what the contemporary environment is that reflects all of those historical forms by which is in front of us. And maybe to a final question. Sure. Um, related to... Um, and I lost the question. Yes, uh, related to provincialism and center and periphery. Mm -hmm. Do you want to comment on that idea mm -hmm. of being in British Columbia? Yeah. Uh, this is um, something that, of course, everybody that grew up here, myself included, like all of the cultural influences, for the most part, came from somewhere else, like being a colonial culture. Um, and my project in a, from the very beginning is was to somehow develop a unique culture, you know, an individualized culture I mean, that's 
unique to here, just from ourselves, instead of always looking somewhere else, which is a kind of a provincial way of, of you know, defining oneself. It's like somebody else has the truth, somebody else has the identity. We only borrow that identity to make ourselves feel good or, or important or whatever. Uh, and so uh, this relationship between center and periphery, where you draw your cultural concepts from, how you relate them to who you are in the moment, where you are, uh, is always been of concern uh, to particularly a provincial, fairly isolated until recently. I mean, uh, modern air travel is, is only within my lifetime uh, to be able to fly to Eastern Canada, the United States, to Europe or Asia or wherever is only a fairly recent phenomena. And of course that's changed the discussion radically uh, because a, the ability to get beyond a provincial mentality that, in other words, only important things only happen somewhere else, that you, what you are doing cannot be important. We get over that by realizing in comparison that we're a part of the larger world too. Um, um, but also uh, the ability to learn from other cultures and to have a cultural interchange so that our culture here is richer by the fact that, you know, in that fact, that's what the concept of cosmopolitanism is, right? It's uh, Rome is the first cosmopolitan city because Rome is with the Roman Empire. All the peoples of different parts of the Roman Empire came to Rome at some point or other and formed a polyglot of cultural concepts that became then became defined what the Roman Empire could be, and even today that became the cosmos in effect. And today we still use the term cosmopolitan to indicate a culture or a particular locations that have an import of a whole variety of cultures and peoples and languages and concepts and everything all mixing up to create this polyglot of modern culture and modern life. Um, and that's what's happening now. And particularly in Vancouver, I see as one of the first postmodern cities as, a, as an example of a kind of a regional city of high monopoly capitalism. In other words, it's, it's a city created out purely out of capitalist colonization, the urbanity of it and everything. Um, but um, integrating that um, development of modern capitalism with a kind of a polyglot internationalized culture is uh, as a result of travel, air travel particularly. But um, even Emily Carr, the early 20th century, uh, you know, as a young artist here, as a painter, uh, goes to Paris to, you know, to pick up the latest of what's happening in modern art and bring it back to the local culture here, which is, she's one of the first modernists here uh, to bring, you know, um, styles of fauvism and quasi-cubism, but mostly fauvism. But also she was very much influenced by Gauguin. And there was another figure you know, he worked in the stock to stock market, Gauguin, uh, wanted to be an artist. He was an artist in post-impressionist in France, moves to Tahiti in the South Pacific, where he discovers Aboriginal culture of the South Pacific and creates an art, a subject matter in his work that then goes back to Paris in the early, in the late, late 19th century. And of course, Emily Carr, when she goes to Paris, when she goes to Brittany, actually, she went to pont des Bains where Gauguin worked and obviously came into contact with Gauguin's work of South Pacific Aboriginal culture. She saw the brainwave. Oh, yes, we have our own Aboriginal culture here, you know. So I'll come back to Vancouver and do arts, do an art language, uh, a subject matter about the Aboriginal culture that we have on the West Coast and all of its art forms. So there's, a, there's the, the global interchange that was already happening over 100 years ago. Well, almost a little bit more than 100 years ago, pretty precisely. She was in Paris in 1911 to 1912 and showed in the Salon de Tom in 1911. So um, that's a little bit more than 100 years ago, not much more, yeah. So I don't know if that's about center and periphery. I've written quite a lot about it and, and thought about it. For me, it's not, uh, I'm not, uh, 
I've traveled enough and I've exhibited in European capitals, uh, you know, in the best places. And uh, I, I enjoy being there and think it's very important and what happens there. But it's not the only place in the world either. Like, and I feel totally confident I can make serious art here just as well as anywhere else. I, don't, I can go anywhere I want, uh, but I'm free to be, leave, but uh, I prefer to be here. <laughs> I'm a homeboy. It's my hometown. Family's here. Friends are here. I can you know, have my workspace, and I can travel when I want to. So we're all a part of the world, the postmodern world. <laughs> and it's always a real pleasure to welcome people from other parts of the world here and to meet them and to uh, have a dialogue, you know, have a parley. <laughs>